sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you in the name of our crucified and risen Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the commandments, Jesus says. And yes, the rich man knew the commandments and had followed them since his youth. And Jesus looked upon him with love. Now, how many of us can say we've followed all those commandments since our youth? How many since last Sunday? <laughs> you lack just one thing, Jesus says to the rich man. And the man must have thought, wow, this is it. Only one thing left to do and the kingdom is mine. ka -ching! But then Jesus drops the money bomb on him, saying, go sell what you own. Give the money to the poor and come follow me. The young man must have thought, that's not fair. It's impossible. Mark tells us the young man was shocked. Well, who wouldn't be shocked? Of course he was shocked. In the ancient Near East, wealth was considered a sign of God's special blessing. The rich were blessed by God, so they must be very near to God. Money and land meant power, just as it does today. Money and land also meant support for the synagogue. Surely God must love them for that. But give it all up? Why, that's impossible. But when Jesus looked at the man and loved him, Jesus wasn't looking for a tithe for the temple. He was looking, he wasn't looking or thinking about the temple budget. He was thinking about living out God's mission, a mission of caring for others, transforming lives. So Jesus tells his disciples, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone rich to enter the kingdom of God. Shocked and astounded, the disciples wonder, if selling everything is a requirement, who can really enter heaven? Dear friends, in this text, being shocked and astounded is probably a good place to start. In our modern dollar bill world, it's all too easy for Jesus' radical call to discipleship to slip off as only pertinent to the ancient Near East certainly not for us today in today's world. But what would it take to shock us today? What would it take to shock and astound us today? Perhaps God telling us to care for the poor, care for the widow, the orphan, to welcome the foreigner, to stand with the oppressed. What do you think? Does that seem shocking anymore? Does that seem impossible? Maybe if Jesus had said it's easier for Elon Musk to go through the night deposit slot at the local bank, it would have been in terms that we could have understood today. But I think his original statement is pretty shocking when we hear it in today's context, which is to say that if you found yourself listening to the gospel lesson with just a little bit of apprehension, if you felt disturbed away by what seems to be Jesus' rejection of wealth, if you're defensively wondering what this might have to do with you, or are warily waiting for the pastor to drop a stewardship plea on you or shake the coins from your pockets, sorry, that's not going to happen. But you are in the right place at the right time to hear Jesus' word and to be disturbed by it. You heard that rightly. You were in the right place at the right time to be disturbed by Jesus' word because the story is meant to disturb us. It's not to meant to give us the warm assurance of a cuddly blanket. It's meant to disturb you and in your shock to question what is really central and what is really important in your life. Material things or Jesus? For you see, the shock and astonishment this story generates in us is the good news. Or at least it will be the good news if we allow God's word to challenge and shape our lives. 
Good news that shakes us out of complacency and false security that our consumer society generates. Good news that shakes us out of our complacency to see what is really happening in our world today. The plague of poverty and oppression. The haves, the have-nots. We need to be disturbed by this story because I think in our rich society we lack a sense of what I will call enoughness. Enoughness. May West once said that too much of a good thing is wonderful. But for the sake of our own health and life, not to mention our spiritual life, we need to understand when enough really is enough. Have you seen a t-shirt that says you can never be too thin or too rich? Never too thin? Well, that may be true for some of us who are locked in mortal combat with our waistline. But try that slogan on a child who woke up in our community this morning staring at an empty bowl. Or starving refugees at a camp in Gaza. Never too rich? We understand that poverty twists and maims and destroys human life. But there are casualties for wealth as well. Men, women, and children chasing the idol of materialism, caught up in the not enoughness of life and wanting only more and more and more material goodies, consuming more and more, thinking perhaps it's a way of salvation. Our lives often seem dependent upon buying the next new important thing. But is that really true life? Is that really true life? What do you think? This shocking and disturbing story of Jesus invites us to reorder our life, to move from a theology of material want to a theology of wanting God. Let me repeat that, to move from a theology of material want, the false gods and idols of materialism, to a theology of wanting God and understanding that God, more than anything, wants you. From a theology of material want to a theology of wanting God moves us to true life, lived in common, everyday, yet profound things and ways of God. God's living word on common paper, common bread and common wine, common water that celebrates new life and is a means of grace for forgiveness. Grace and forgiveness that send us into the world in ministry to serve God's mission of caring for the poor, feeding the hungry, standing with the oppressed. It is a mission that transforms lives. You see, our holiest rights aren't purchased at Abercrombie and Fitch or a new car dealership. They pour water, they break bread, they share a cup of salvation. And we need this redeeming, disturbing story to remind us that there are hungers that only God can satisfy. We long for peace, a God-centered, peaceful life that we simply cannot buy, one we can't find on sale at Amazon. True life in our material world begins by asking the question that the young man asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you think? Can you buy it? Or is it a free gift from God because of your faith and belief? Jesus' challenge to us in this text is to put God in the center of our lives not the idols of material things, the false god of not enoughness. So before you turn around and walk away, inventory your possessions, remember your life is in the hands of the one who told us today that in God all things are possible. This story tells us that what is really shocking is that in our materialistic lives, 
We are in the hands of the one who can be trusted, the one in whom all things are possible, even what we think might be impossible, the one who will not consent to a diminished materialistic vision of human life, the one who loves us enough not to sugarcoat the answer to the question, what must I do? For the one who makes all things possible invites us to imagine fresh, fresh new ways of living, new ways of reaching out beyond our walls to embrace the poor, the hungry, the homeless, the neighbor whose life might not be very pretty. Over the next few weeks, you will hear me say time and time again, we are on a stewardship journey not to look back at our parents' offering plate. Because, dear friends, we're not going back to our parents' offering plate. We are on a stewardship journey to the future, a fresh new understanding of stewardship, a fresh understanding that stewardship doesn't exist just to honor a budget. Stewardship exists to honor God and through, the minist and, and through the ministries of this church, ministries that transform lives, ministries that lead to fresh new life for all of you sitting here and those who are outside these church walls. And that journey, that journey to understanding of ministry as a fresh new transformed life begins at our Lord's table of grace today where we will come like beggars with our hands out, longing for fresh, new, forgiven life, real, true life. Sisters and brothers, the good news of this story is that God loves us enough to shake us from the impossible material greed of life, to shake us with a simple summons by Jesus to ask ourselves, what is truly the right thing to do? And then come and follow Jesus doing it. Transforming lives. Transforming lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's God's mission. And that's why this church exists. For no other reason than to transform lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Perhaps that may seem like an impossible task, an impossible task like the young man thought he faced. But always remember, through God, all things are possible. All things are possible for you, for me, and for all people. And thanks be to God for a gift such as this. Amen.